Greetings, everyone. Uh, Kalispera says, it's great to see uh, the relaxing of our COVID rules. Um, let's hope things stay this way for quite a while. But we will continue to offer the seminars totally online, at least until the end of the winter period, probably until the end uh, of August before we reconsider going back to the Greek Centre. Just some housekeeping items and some information on our upcoming seminars. Uh, firstly, for those that have questions to submit at the end of the seminar, simply post them in the comments section of Facebook or YouTube and we'll pick them up from there. Next week, we have two seminars planned, one on Monday and one on Thursday, both online, both starting at 7 p.m. our usual time. So same bat time, same bat station. The Monday seminar will be in Greek by Professor Charis Athanasiadis from the Department of University and is titled How We Remember, How Should We Remember 1821. It basically will look at how the 1821 revolution has been depicted through school history texts during the ages. The second seminar uh, next Thursday is by Associate Professor Nick Demanis, who many of you might know from the University of New South Wales History Department, and he'll be speaking on the Battle of uh, Navarino. This is an important naval battle which changed the fortunes of the Greek struggle, just about as about to implode due to the uh, intended science strife by the war in Greek. Uh, I highly recommend both talks. Now let's get to tonight's seminar. And in this respect, I would like to thank tonight's uh, sponsor, Maria Di Chio, in memory of Eleni Harris. The topic is Cyprus in 1821, Myths, Realities, Forgetting and Remembering. Associate Professor Andrekos Varnava. Uh, if we look at the recent history of Cyprus, uh, 15th century and afterwards, it came under Venetian rule in 1489, but immediately after that was subjected to raids by the Ottomans. It finally succumbed to the Ottomans in 1571, only several months before the Battle of uh, Lepanto, where European powers defeated the Ottoman fleet in the Mediterranean. It would remain in Ottoman hands for the next 300 years until 1878, where after the Russo-Turkish War, it came under control of the British Empire. When the Greek Revolution broke out in 1821, Many Cypriots sympathised with, uh, with Greek aspirations of independence. Some even took part in the struggle. Many also lost their lives for their allegiance to the Greek cause. Uh, to elaborate on this story, we have Andrekos Varadma from the History Department of Flinders University in South Australia. Andreko is a former Melbourneian, born and raised in Melbourne by Cypriot parents, uh, and who has presented in our seminar series in the past on numerous occasions. We welcome him back once again. Um, his undergraduate studies were in history at the University of at Monash University, and this was followed by a PhD at the University of Melbourne. He is a prolific writer. I won't go through his resume list of publications, but his books include four academic monographs, with another one being planned at the moment, and the most recent being The Assassination in Cyprus and Not Before and the origins of your January 2021 by Anthem Press. Enough for me, I'll pass on the baton to our speaker tonight, um, Andreko Vardava. Thank you, Nick, for that uh, lovely introduction. Thank you, uh, as always, for your invitation uh, and for having me on the seminar series. Uh, thank you as well for actually inspiring uh, myself and Yanni Cartledge, whom who is also presenting later on and has presented before to the seminar. Uh, thanks for, you know, inspiring us to put together an, a, a volume actually on, on, on our talks from the seminar and from uh, other people that we've invited, uh, a volume titled New Perspectives on the Greek War of Independence 200 Years On, which we're looking at bringing out next year with Palgrave. So look out for that. Um, and today my paper is based on the chapter from that book, which I'm almost finished. Um, so let me, well, let me put the PowerPoint on. There we go. Um, now, so the my talk tonight focuses on two aspects of 
the relationship between Cyprus and the Greek War of Independence. On the one hand, the myths and realities associated with the role of the island during the war and the real impact that the war had on the island. And secondly, the way Greek Cypriot uh, nationalists, particularly right-wing nationalists, have constructed a commemorative legacy of the war and linked this to their own uh, struggle, as they themselves called it, for, for Enosis. Um, now, both constructions were part of the creation of an official narrative of Greek Cypriot national identity. Ultimately, these two periods uh, that are in focus, the first being during and immediately after the Greek War of Independence, and the second one encompassing the yearly commemoration of the outbreak, both form cardinal points on the script of the Greek nation in Cyprus. So my paper today, uh, and indeed the chapter for the volume, uh, which, which will be, in, of course, more detail, aims to deconstruct both by exploring the evidence pertaining to each period through a series of thematic focal points. And, you know, we'll see how we go tonight with how much of it I get through. Um, I'm sure I'll get most of it through anyway. Before exploring the subject, it's important to understand the literature now, in general accounts, Cyprus primarily features within the Western Philhellenist tradition as a place that suffered under barbarous Ottoman rule with the execution of Archbishop Kiprianos and other notables being the main focus. For Greek and Greek Cypriot writers and Philhellenes, Cyprus has been seen as a part of the Greek world and united as one behind the war. The account by Gumulidis uh, in the mid 1980s is a classic example of this mix of selective historical reconstruction and nationalist myth making narrative. The focus on Western sources has been continued under others in more recent times, like Kitromilidis, who has, for example, excluded from his most recent study any Ottoman sources. Now, as part of the nationalizing the histories of Cyprus, several historians of the late Ottoman and early British periods, such as Haris Tavridis, Michael and Michael, uh, Rolando Scaccionis and myself, have taken a more inclusive and thorough archivally driven approach with a broader international context. In doing so, we have reevaluated the role of Cyprus both before, sorry, before, during and after the Greek War of Independence and its legacy on Cyprus. And this talk builds upon that while digging a little deeper into certain aspects. Let me, bef before I really get into it, a little personal anecdote. Now, when I lived in Cyprus between September of 2006 and January of 2009, I can recall being deeply shocked at the level of Greek Cypriot hatred for Turks during the public holiday commemorating the start of the Greek War of Independence, which is, of course, the 25th of March. This is saying something since my mother was horrifically displaced by the Turkish military intervention in 1974. Now, my wife and I lived near the secondary school named in honor of Archbishop Kiprianos, the Lyceum Ethnomata Kiprianos, which is on Gandaras Avenue in Strovolos, Nicosia which along with other schools, although particularly this one, would have banners and posters on the fence with slogans such as a good Turk is a dead Turk, death to Turks, Turks out of Cyprus, and so forth and so on. Such public hatred does not, or does not distinguish between the Turks of today and those of 200 years ago, nor between those of today and those responsible for the military intervention in 1974. Uh, nor does it distinguish between Turks and Turkish Cypriots, with whom the latter most Greek Cypriots remain committed to reunifying with. So the next part perhaps tries to, in, on, on one level anyway, understand this hatred and how it revolves around certain um, myths created about the involvement of and the impact of, of Cyprus, on Cyprus sorry, uh, of the Greek War of Independence and its immediate aftermath. It focuses on uh, the three aspects three aspects of this, the execution uh, of Kiprianos and the other notables, but mainly on Kiprianos, 
the, the, some, the exaggerations about a forced mass emigration as a result of the executions. And finally, um, the embellishments associated with the mass volunteers from Cyprus for the Greek war and the notion of a mass organized revolt in the island in 1833 uh, from uh, a monk known as Ioannikios, uh, who had uh, apparently served in the Greek War of Independence. Now, perhaps the next bit should be titled the, the myths of the two executions, since the execution of Archbi Archbishop Kiprianos in Cyprus has some similarities with that of the earlier execution of the ecumenical patriarch Gregory V, and it's worth retelling that earlier execution for the purposes of comparison. On Easter Sunday, 22nd of April 1821, the Ottoman authorities under order of Sultan Mahmud II arrested and executed the ecumenical patriarch, Gregory V. It was the execution of this policy that made Gregory V an ethnomartyr for the revolutionaries and for Greeks ever since. Um, but in fact, some historians have noted, such as Richard Clogg, that Gregory V, who had previously condemned the French Revolution and the ideas of the Enlightenment, did everything to prevent the success of the revolutionaries and to allay the concerns of the Ottoman authorities that it would spread and succeed. As a trusted advisor to the port, it was, a, it was his advice, namely that the revolt was led, uh, that, the, that there was little support for the revolt and had no chance of success that led to his downfall. And was proved, uh, and was proved wrong for Mahmoud II after Alexandros Sipsilandis's uh, uh, forces crossed the Prut River and marched into Moldavia. Accused of knowing about the advance and putting the government into a false sense of security, Gregory V pleaded his innocence, implemented all the directives of the government, including the excommunication of the rebels, and at every opportunity expressed his loyalty to the government. Even when the Sultan succeeded in convincing the Sayhul Islam, Haji Halil Effendi, to issue a fatwa for a general massacre of all Greeks living in the Ottoman Empire, Gregory V managed to convince him that only a few Greeks were involved in the uprising and to recall the fatwa. It is no surprise that Haji Halil Effendi was later executed by order of Mahmoud II for the same reasons that Gregory V was executed, for providing advice that proved incorrect and risking the integrity of the Ottoman Empire. Here it can be seen that the same fate was suffered by the Muslim as well as by the Christian, for the same reason, that is, for providing misleading advice to the detriment of the Ottoman state. Similarly, in Cyprus, Archbishop Kiprianos was not executed for supporting the revolutionaries. There, there, there wasn't any uh, evidence of it. Um, thus, he be also became an ethnomartyr as a result of the rash decision-making of the Ottoman authorities. With this example, however, the decision was an opportunity for the local governor on the island, Kuchuk Mehmed, to remove a powerful figure standing between him and his desire to repress the island. By the late 18th and into the 19th centuries, the Cypriot Orthodox Church had become very powerful in Cyprus, powerful enough to remove a governor and an ally for the government against rebellion, which was Muslim or Muslim and Christian led, as in other parts of the Ottoman Empire. For example, in 1754, Archbishop Philotheos managed to convince the Ottoman government to appoint the Cypriot Orthodox bishops as Gojabashis, that is, as representatives of the Raya, the Orthodox Christians, with the power to go to Constantinople and circumvent the local authorities in the island. In 1768, the newly enthroned Archbishop Chrysanthos managed to have a tyrannical government recalled and replaced. Then in 1804, Muslim and Orthodox uh, peasants rioted in, against taxes and the dragoman Haji Yorgagis Cornesios, supported by the Orthodox and Muslim elite, fled to Constantinople to bring Ottoman troops. In this class struggle, exploited Muslims and Orthodox challenged the Muslim and Orthodox ruling class. The church paid for the troops, but when more Muslims than Orthodox were killed, some Muslims resented the power of Archimandrite Kiprianos, who had outmaneuvered Archbishop Chrysanthos and Gornesios. Kiprianos wielded much power after becoming Archbishop in 1809. Kuchuk Mehmed, the new governor in 1819, resented this and saw an opportunity to remove Kiprianos after the execution of Gregory V. Kuchuk Mehmed implored the Sultan to issue orders to eliminate Kiprianos and 500 other 
Orthodox elite in July of 1821. Kuchuf Mehmed had falsely charged Giprianos for supposedly colluding with the Greek rebels to spread the revolt to Cyprus. Giprianos and Gregory V, however, were essentially cut from the same stone as neither of them um, supported the revolutionaries. With Giprianos, there was even there has even been uh, the fabrication that in 1818 he secretly joined the Filikieteria. But both men were strongly opposed to the nationalistic ideas and the Freemasonry of the Filikieteria. In 1815, Giprianos excommunicated Freemasons in Larnaca. As with Gregory V, he bent over backwards trying to placate the Ottomans, giving them assurances that he and his flock were absolutely loyal and that the revolution was led by a small group. In reply to Kuchuk Med's demand for authority to execute Kiprianos, another Orthodox elite, the Sultan, asked Kiprianos to demand in an encyclical that the Orthodox surrender all arms, which, which he did. And then he added, telling Kuchuk Mehmed that, and I quote, upon examining our archives, we nowhere find from the date that this island fell under our sway that its Christian inhabitants have been guilty of any disloyalty to our government. But on the contrary, when the Turks revolted, the Christians have joined our forces. The governor, however, persisted. He pressured the Sultan by concocting the charges against Kiprianos that he was colluding with the revolutionaries to spread the revolt to Cyprus. What's interesting is that Kutschuk Mehmet was later recalled in response to the representations of Cypriot Muslims who had gone to Constantinople up after the massacres. So this supports the, uh, this interpretation that um, it was based on false charges that Kiprianos was uh, in fact executed. Now this is also connected to the claim that Kiprianos somehow planned to bring the uprising to Cyprus and contribute towards the war by recruiting Cypriots. There is little evidence to support any contention that large numbers of Cypriots fought in the war and even Gumulidis uh, struggled to make a case for any mass contribution. He also neglected to mention one of the more celebrated volunteers, Ioannikios, the monk who happens to have come from my mother's village of Ayosilias in the Gadpas Peninsula. Research by Michalis and Michael from the University of Cyprus has shown that Ioannikios, who had led a revolt in the Garpas in 1833, was hardly the Greek nationalist revolutionary claimed by folklore, particularly as his ill-fated revolt primarily consisted of a handful of disenchanted Albanian troops uh, who were remnants in the island from uh, Muhammad Ali's forces. Um, whom, like him, were looking to challenge the local Ottoman authorities with no intention of uniting the island to Greece. As part of this uh, interpretation, I, I've also uh, re-examined the idea that there was a mass emigration uh, as a result of of these uh, of this uh, of these uh, executions. There is evidence of an emigration, but not one that we could call a mass emigration. It suggests that some people left because of the suppression, but that most left for other reasons, such as because of the Ottoman corruption and poor economic mismanagement. It is also important to know that these sources are mainly from French diplomats who may have had a prejudice against the Ottomans, France having had been uh, quite anti-Ottoman during this period and favoring um, Muhammad Ali in Egypt. Now, some Cypriots, mainly elites and members of prominent families, fled the island in the wake of the repression of the 1820s and also from their occupation of the island by the forces of Muhammad Ali, the ruler of Egypt. Now, Hill, who had written his history of Cyprus in the late in the, in the 40s, uh, used the published archives of the French consul to argue that there was significant depopulation. He referred to how Banaretos, the archbishop in 1830, tried to convince Cypriots in Egypt to return in exchange for paying less tax. Gumulidis, again using the French records selected uh, by, uh, by a Greek Cypriot, Giriazis, claimed that thousands of Cypriots chose to emigrate from their island, that exile or even death was preferable, and I'm quoting now, to the miserable living conditions in their native land. And that between 1821 and 25, at least 25,000 escaped, 
mostly to Greece, where he claimed they joined the struggle. This large, or the, this large emigration led to the deterioration of the economy since hundreds, hundreds of acres of land were left uncultivated. But there's no concrete evidence uh, presented to support these, uh, these claims, nor was any distinction made between, for example, the peasantry and the educated elite. Interestingly, Gumulidis contradicted Hill's assertion, despite the fact that they're using the same documents, that the authorities had tried to induce Cypriots to return in 1830, claiming that the idea was entertained but not adopted then. Gumulidis further claimed that after Greece became independent, many Cypriots who had previously fled returned to Cyprus with Greek citizenship and therefore they were no longer rayas and, for, and, and therefore free from paying taxes to the Ottomans. And protected by the three guarantor powers of Greece, Britain, France, and Russia. This claimed Gumulidis encouraged other Cypriots to go to Greece where they acquired Greek citizenship and returned to the island. He then claimed that Archbishop Banarados appealed in 1831 to all Cypriots with Greek citizenship to renounce it and return to the status of the Raya. This appeal was rejected by the Greek citizens in Cyprus in a signed uh, document. And in all, we only have 43 signatures on this document who appealed to the Russian consul for protection. The documents and the way they have been interpreted are clearly problematic. Although Hill exhibited caution, Gomulidis took a nationalistic line as reflected in his book and subsequent publications. There was an obvious flaw in his argument that 25 Cypriots fled the island mostly to Greece to fight in the war and that thousands of these returned with Greek citizenship inspiring others to follow when there were only 43 Greek citizens in the island in 1831 signing this document. Okay, there is additional evidence as, as well, which um, I won't go into uh, for, the, uh, for the purposes of uh, time. Um, but I think that that shows how um, it is a, it's clearly problematic to claim that there was a mass emigration of that size, certainly 25,000. So the next part of my talk is on the after, after the Greek War of Independence. Uh, and firstly, I want to look at how um, it was commemorated, the, uh, the history of that, and then how this became, how the Greek war became important uh, for Greek Cypriot pro enesis nationalists who mod modeled their uh, violent political methods on the Philikia Teria. Now for the first half of, well, let me, let me just introduce that a bit more. Um, so first I want to explore the irregular commemorations during the British period and the British insistence that such celebrations remain peaceful and follow regulations introduced to ensure that no clashes with Turkish Cypriots resulted from them. It then focuses on the significance played by EREK, the National Radical Union of Cyprus, uh, which was formed in 1929, and then by EOKA, uh, the National Organization of Cypriot Fighters, uh, on the Greek War of Independence for their ideology, recruitment, and methods. Then the, and then the focus becomes the, uh, if I, hopefully I can get to the Republican period um, and looking at the national holidays and commemorative uh, stamps and so forth, which I have an image of. For the first half of British rule, Cypriots did not commemorate very much the 25th of March in connection with the Greek war. Of course, it's a religious holiday as well, which is a separate matter. So Fronius, who was the archbishop since 1869, was driven by his Romeo Sini, his Eastern Orthodox identity and desire to ensure harmonious relations with the Ottoman authorities and the Muslim community more generally. After Sophronius welcomed the British in 1878, his speech was criticized, for example, by the Greek Brotherhood of Cypriots in Egypt for failing to refer to their desire for enosis. In, re in his reply, Sophronius questioned the claim of the Brotherhood regarding the nation that, that as, as Greek that Cypriots belonged to, revealing that, and I quote, we have not up to now experienced something like this, and arguing that it would only endanger Cypriot customs, but also Cypriot interests to demand enosis 
because there were opposing interests, British and Muslim Cypriot, but also that it was against the best interests of the Orthodox Cypriots as well. The first celebrations to mark the Greek War of Independence were held in Nicosia in 1885, and they weren't held again the next year. This is particularly telling given the Greek national identity developing amongst some urban intelligentsia. An example of this is Vasilis Mikhailidis, who is a sort of, you know, a, a nationalist uh, poet, first amongst nationalist poets in Cyprus, who penned in the Cypriot dialect his epic poem, the 9th of July, 1821, in the late 1880s on the executions in Cyprus in 1821, in which Kiprianos was depicted as having rejected the opportunity to escape in order to die as a martyr. Uh, this version of events is accepted amongst the broader Cypriot community even today and, and may indeed uh, be in part true um, because the poem refers to um, Turkish uh, Cypriots trying to uh, convince the Archbishop to, to flee. Now, after Sophronius died in 1900 and a split resulted in the Cypriot Orthodox Church between those with a pro-Orthodox religious identity and a Greek national identity, the latter started to revise Cypriot history. For example, they claimed that Sophronius had in fact wel welcomed the British High Commissioner in 1878 with a demand for enosis, included, uh, which was included on a plaque which they constructed uh, and also uh, a plaque on his statue, sorry, which they constructed, and also by reinventing Kiprianos as an ethnomartyr in 1901, in a 1901 statue, with a photo of the statue and his portrait becoming popular postcards in 1906. Then in 1921, Greek Cypriot nationalist elites decided to organize a march in remembrance of the 100-year anniversary of the outbreak of the Greek War of Independence. The British governor at the time, Sir Malcolm Stevenson, who had been in Cyprus for five years, had not experienced anything like this in the previous five years and was consequently first and foremost surprised and secondly concerned especially about their plans to march in the Turkish quarter of the, Turkish quarters of the various towns, especially the one in Nicosia. He and, the he and the police authorities considered it a possible provocation to the Turkish Cypriots and thus passed regulations to restrict the processions to the grounds of the churches. Stevenson's fears of disturbances between Christians and Muslims were real, since on the 6th and 7th of April 1921, disturbances occurred in Nicosia when Greek Cypriots attempted to march into the Turkish quarter, carrying Greek flags, shouting and singing uh, slogans and songs. The police stopped them, but Stevenson thought that it could escalate, and he uh, decided to call for troops, British troops from Egypt, which in the end did not come. He blamed the most radical of the Greek Cypriot leaders for contravening the decision to restrict the procession to church grounds. Of course, those uh, behind these processions, Archbishop Girillos II and Makarios, the Bishop of Gerinya, protested and uh, basically blamed the British for what was happening, they said that um, the festival, and I quote, used to be celebrated even in the time of Turkish rule, and since the English occupation onwards, it has been the custom to celebrate it with still greater grandeur. Of course, this doesn't appear to be uh, the case. Additionally, they claimed that the Muslims would not be offended. Now, the Muslims themselves spoke out, and one leading Cypriot Muslim warned that the, that the agitation, as he called it, had so much aggravated relations that, and I quote, nobody could foresee the degree of disaster to which it would lead if allowed to go too far. And finally, there was the Greek consul uh, who had not been told or consented to being part of the procession, and, and I quote him, protested at once to the framers of the program that they had been guilty of great rudeness and impropriety in taking such a course and informed, that that, that informed them that he had no intention of taking any part in anything but the recognized customary annual ceremonies that is in the church and the subsequent reception at his own house. Now, if antagonism had been the aim of the Greek Cypriot nationalists 
1921 in connection with the commemorations for the 100 years of the outbreak of the Greek War of Independence, their more radical far right wing colleagues took antagonism to new levels in 1931. In 1929, after a successful period when a moderate nationalist working with the British had dominated the political landscape, a group of radical far right Greek Cypriots who had fascist inclinations, led by the journalist Savas Loisidis and financed by the Bishop of Gerenia Makarios, established in Gerenia a secret society to bring about Enosis immediately without any intervening period of self-government or independence by mimicking the Philikia Teria of the 1820s, in other words, by taking up arms. In 1931, while the Cypriot people were suffering from the impact of the Great Depression, this group um, this group attempted to lead a pro-Enosis anti-British uh, mob in riots and in damaging government property and was subsequently punished severely by the British authorities after it led to the burning of government house in Nicosia. While the constitution was suspended, many were deported and others were sent to rural areas under house arrest. Seemingly, while in Athens and with their small group of supporters in Cyprus, they probably orchestrated the assassination in January of 34 of the leading lawyer and politician Antonios Triandafilidis, who was trying to rebuild relations between the Cypriot people and the British after the events of October 31. Now, these probable assassins were intimately connected to the formation of Eoka only 17 years later, which also took inspiration from the Philikiateria and the Greek War of Independence after drawing, drawing links with it. Eoka began its violence against the British colonial authorities on the 1st of April 1955. However, the origins of Eoka date back to 1929 with the formation of Erek by the, by the far right wing nationalists discussed earlier, since it was a secret organization planning to use arms like the Philikiateria. The remnants of Erek were Axis collaborators in Greece during the war and joined the royalist forces in the civil war. They brought their anti-communist uh, and immediate Enosis and only Enosis policy to Cyprus in 1947, uh, as they were, and those who had been uh, previously deported were permitted to return to join their other far right, ring, far right wing colleagues. Bishop Makarios then became Archbishop Makarios II in in December 47 and steered Cyprus away from any compromise with the British, including away from a new constitution and self-government which they had offered, while his successor, Archbishop Makarios III, took matters to the next level. In March of 51, the newly elected Archbishop was convinced by none other than Savas Loisidis, while in Athens, to the formation of an armed group along the lines of the Philikiateria, at least in their eyes it was along the lines of the Philikiateria, and the earlier Erek which would stop at nothing to achieve enosis. And in May of 51, Colonel George Grievous, a far right wing paramilitary leader in Greece, um, was recruited as the leader of this armed group and he began preparations to fight the British in Cyprus. Now from the beginning, Eoka linked itself with the Philikiateria and the Greek War of Independence in its revolutionary leaflet distributed on the 1st of April of 55 on the day it began its violent activities, it appealed to young Cypriots to, to identify their struggle with previous struggles of Hellenism. I won't read the long quote. Um, the use of the word struggle, both at the time and since, was deliberate since Greek Cypriots continued to refer to the violence of Eoka as the struggle, as Greeks refer to the Greek War of Independence as the struggle. The leaflet was also signed Death or Victory, another hint at an effort at continuity with the Greek War of Independence, in which the motto had been Victory or Death. For Grievous, the Orca campaign was a revolution like that started in 1821, and in his memoirs he titled Chapter 2, Birth of a Revolution. Eoka turned to such narratives during its campaign when Greek Cypriots might have become tired of the emergency or seeing the island drifting into civil war, contemplating a compromise. In March of 58, Eoka implored the Greek Cypriots to draw inspiration from the heroic sufferings and triumphant struggle of their ancestors during the Greek War of Independence. Then on the 8th of February 1959, only two days before the signing of the Zurich Accords, which would result in the conclusion of the emergency and the formation of an independent Cyprus, 
and with the full knowledge that such talks were leading to a compromise, Grievous issued a leaflet that asked, oh, how similar is the rising of 21 with the present Cyprus struggle. This was not restricted to Cyprus and to Eoka specifically, but spread to the Greek and Cypriot diaspora, even those on the left wing who supported Enosis during the emergency period. In Australia, the Communist Party of Australia was behind the Committee of Cypriot Self-Determination, which was largely led by Professor Kenneth Buckley, an economic historian at the University of Sydney. And in the lead up to an organized march to commemorate the 25th of March anniversary of 1821 in 1956, the committee issued a leaflet in which it connected the fight of the Cypriots and that of the Greeks started 145 years earlier. Okay, so I'll read it. The day of the national anniversary approaches and again finds the Greek people and the indomitable people of Cyprus, the bulwarks, in the struggle for national freedom as in 1821. So now one people struggles by the side of the other for the ideal of liberty for all humanity. The struggle of the 20th century continues. Okay. So I'll very briefly talk uh, in summary on the Republican period. Um, uh, just to make a few points, um, and I'll show the image now. Um, it is a national holiday in Cyprus. Um, uh, it's important to note that these holidays were not introduced after the withdrawal of the Turkish Cypriots from the consociational system of government in December of 63, but were in fact enshrined in the 1960 constitution uh, of the Republic in Article 5. Um, Broadly speaking, there are two elements that reinforce this for Greek Cypriots. The control of the, of the Greek Cypriot authorities of national history as a process of uh, Greek um, national uh, creation through official publications and commemorations, such as these stamps to commemorate the 150 year uh, outbreak of the Greek War of Independence in 1971, uh, which are part of my collection. Um, and the education system itself, they all uh, have, uh, a re they all reinforce uh, Greek Cypriots and their contribution to the Greek uh, wars of liberation, including the Greek war of independence. And two, the focus amongst both Greek and Greek Cypriot literature circles with 1821. Um, so there are, of course, the annual commemorations. There are, so very briefly now, we'll just go through this. There are the annual commemorations. There's the official histories written by, uh, uh, if you like, official historians like Kostandino Spiridakis, who was the first uh, minister uh, of education and culture, um, as well as other official historians. Um, and the, the stamps, as I mentioned, are, are part of the commemoration. There is, of course, um, various plays that were um, written. There is one that I've read by Jakovos Kithreotis, published in 1979, in which Kiprianos, as in the epic poem of Michaelidis, was portrayed as the willing ethnomata, sacrificing himself for the Greek nation in Cyprus. Um, and then, of course, there is the history in the curriculum uh, um, which I understand you'll be hearing a talk about next week. And in the case of Cyprus, um, as uh, as I've shown before, this has resulted in a rather one-dimensional picture of Cypriot history geared towards creating, as my personal example before showed, uh, Greek Cypriot nationalists uh, who basically hate Turks. Um, so... For example, in the three in the year three of the secondary school textbook, it, um, it form, the Greek War of Independence forms part uh, of the historical context uh, described in the official guidebook as covering the, that period um, and the main events of the war, the Philhenic movement, and finally how the Greek War of Independence played out in Cyprus, with special emphasis on the 9th of July, eighteen twenty-one 
to the so-called uprisings of 1833 by Ioan Nikios and how this and fr how from this emerged the Enosis movement. And finally, and I'll end on this point, in the 21st century, uh, Kiprianos as an ethnomartyr and symbol of Greek separate resistance to Ottoman rule of, continues. It would be uh, remiss not to mention the lavishly produced tome by the Holy Monastery of Mahiras, which was sponsored um, by some important uh, sponsors, uh, such as the Hellenic Bank, uh, with an endorsement from the Archbishop, uh, the current Archbishop, the volume is beautifully illustrated with hundreds of photos relating to Kiprianos, including many of the images of his arrest and execution, as well as of his statues throughout the island. It also includes a list of the hundreds of streets, roads and avenues named after him across the island. And in, it includes a, uh, a speech, uh, sorry, includes an introduction, um, uh, which is quite interesting, uh, as it consists of descriptions of correspondence and sources from this period. Of course, these are very selectively uh, chosen, uh, often taken out of context and sometimes even embellished to exaggerate uh, for their own purposes. So I think I'll leave it there. Um, and hopefully that I've uh, been able to discuss the myths, realities and legacies of Cyprus and 1821. Uh, thank you, Andreko, for demystifying a few things. Thank you for that presentation. Um, I, the floor is open to, to questions, so please submit your questions in the um, comments section and we'll sort of pick them up from there. Um, I might just quick start off the um, questioning. Um, within about a decade of the um, start of the Greek Revolution, you also had the um, assassination of Kapodistrias, and very soon after that, the um, imposition of the monarchy on Otto in Greece. Um, what was the reaction in Cyprus to those events? Did the archives say anything? There, there isn't anything uh, that I've come across in the Ottoman archives or in the British archives on the assassin assassination of Kapodistrias from a Cypriot perspective. Um, it's quite interesting because by that point in time, there is a there is a new archbishop in Cyprus who is very much, and, and indeed the governor has by, has long since gone. The island had been under the occupation of Muhammad Ali as well, um, and possibly was still under the occupation at the time of Gabodistias's assassination. So it it was very much a return to what I would call a form of normality, although the troops. The Muhammad Ali's troops there were, of course, not a normal situation, and they were they were quite well known for their well. I mean, troops of this nature they're generally speaking badly behaved. I mean, they're not in action; they're there to occupy a place, so they're pretty restless. Um, yeah. Okay, and, and then the um, the imposition of a, of a monarchy. Do any the archives say anything about that either? Or? Yeah, no, I've not come across anything about the imposition of the the monarchy in Greece. That's quite interesting. Um, I mean, yeah, I mean, moving a hundred years or so later with the World War One and the schism. I mean, the Cypriots were certainly uh, on on the whole those educated Cypriots, you know, involved in intellectual discussions. Let's put it that way. Were primarily pro-royalists. Um, but back in the 1830s, um, it's, there's very little evidence on what their views were. Okay. Um, thanks for that. Uh, we're just waiting for some questions to come through. Nothing's been sent to me um, um, so far. Um, I think after the, um, the Russo-Turkish War, then... Um, Cyprus came under the control of the British Empire. Yes. Do you want to sort of elaborate on that period at all? And um... absolutely, I mean, the, that that period was what I would consider a, a momentous. It was momentous for for the history of Cyprus, um, and which isn't doesn't doesn't receive enough attention in Cyprus. I mean, transitioning from an Ottoman government to a British government was momentous. Um, it meant a gradual admittedly, a gradual and 
to some extent, limited introduction of what we might call a, a liberal government in 18, uh, very soon Cyprus in the early 1880s received a, a constitution, which was very liberal, given that not even Malta had a constitution as liberal as that, and Malta had been under British rule for this part of the century. Uh, it was given a legis Cyprus was given a legislative council with a local majority, even though with the British um, votes and the Muslim votes, they could outvote, so to speak, the Greek Cypriots. Um, this this didn't really happen often in the 19th century. This only becomes a feature of the constitution later on into in, in the early 20th century. And, and, and it doesn't happen all the time either. Um, I spoke before about Sophronius. I've published quite a lot about Sophronius. There's, there's uh, also this book here, The Archbishops of Cyprus uh, in the Modern Age, which I did with Michalis and Michael. And that is that is an, uh, enlightening on the role of the eth the ethnarch and how it evolved and changed which um because we start with archbishop chrysanthos who i mentioned earlier uh, 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 who was archbishop for a very long time off the top of my head i can't remember but three decades i'm guessing in the in in, in from the late 18th into the early 19th century and and he was if you like to put it in, in this way, he was sent away and Gibrihanos became Archbishop. And we end with the current, uh, no, we end with the previous, uh, the, the second to last Archbishop, not the current one. But there are important chapters there on Sophronius and, and that early British period in which he's endeavouring to work with the British, just as he had worked with the Ottomans, to ensure um, peace and uh, security and that everybody um, got along well, basically. He was very practical, I would say, and rejected um, and to, to one, on one level didn't quite understand nationalism as, as was understood by others, perhaps, as it was growing and developing. Um, but yeah, the British occupation is a massive turning point in the history of Cyprus. Um, you also mentioned that the island was sort of um, basically under control of Muhammad Ali. Yeah. Um, so um, both basically the, the Pasha sort of Egypt and so forth. Yeah. Um, when, when did that control change over? Um, and also during the period of Muhammad Ali, did, did, um, did many Cypriots um, go, to, go to Egypt, to Alexandria and Cairo, like um, a lot of the Greeks from the mainland to sort of um, seek their luck and... Uh, well, some of it's quite interesting, um, and not a lot of work has been done on the how many. We, I mean, how many years he was even in Cyprus? How many years these forces were in Cyprus? There's that's open to conjecture. Um, some arguing that uh, it was um, pretty much until about 1829, 1830. Others, others saying that it continued after that. Um, Clearly, there were still troops there in 1833, whether they were there in an official capacity or they had um, left, uh, so to speak, uh, gone AWOL, because we see Ioannikios and those Albanians, they those Albanians were remnants of Muhammad Ali's forces in the island. <clears throat> he himself actually uh, is of Albanian uh, descent. Um, as for the Cypriots, there there is, of course, I would say that the most significant Cypriot community outside of Cyprus was the one in Egypt. But um, I'm not sure where it was larger, probably Alexandria, but there was also a very sizable one in Cairo, both places having committees by the time the British have arrived in Cyprus. Um, and it, some of those Cypriots um, were there, le went there so during, these, during the 1820s when um, as I tried to explain before, it's it, it's connected to what happened with Gibrianos and the other notables, but it's also connected to the general situation more broadly with the um, instability, the economic mismanagement and downturn and the occupying forces of Muhammad Ali. Um, but, uh, and they find themselves in, in Egypt and the community is growing from from that time. Um, 
but I would guess that there were already Cypriots there from before, and that's why these people gravitated towards these places as well. Because e e Egypt isn't as close as, for example, you know, Syria or uh, southern parts of Anatolia, um, where we don't see significant numbers of Cypriots yeah. or as significant. Yeah. Um, we've got the question starting to flow now. One from Christos Fifis. In your view, was Kiprianos an ethnomartyr? And what does make an ethnomartyr? Well, in in my in my view, he ultimately, first of all, there's the uh, the, the evidence to suggest that he he could have um, escaped is interesting because there isn't any archival material to to verify that. But if he was, if he had that opportunity and he took, so to speak. Well, it's not the bullet, but anyway, if he if he took it, so to speak, because he thought that if he did escape, the Ottomans would let loose more broadly, then in that sense, he's an ethno martyr, but not in the sense that he has been portrayed. He's he tr he did it because he wanted to save Cypriot lives, right? He didn't do it for the revolution, so to speak, because he he wasn't um, he wasn't he he wasn't supporting the revolution um he he tried to do everything he could uh to put that across to the ottomans um when he had met with the filigierteria if those accounts are indeed uh true he basically told them that he couldn't help them and he he would perhaps try to help them with some funds but that was it he didn't want any trouble in cyprus basically and he said that cyprus couldn't couldn't go down that path Okay, thank you. Um, another question from Theo. Um, around 1821, what was the rough breakdown ethnically or religiously of um, Cyprus's population? And, and what was, let's say, roughly the overall population at the time? Well, that is, that is a contentious question. Um, firstly, firstly, because the Ottomans, when they conducted censuses, they only counted the males, right? And there weren't too many censuses conducted during this period. Um, the estimates vary widely from travelers to consuls. You know, they they weren't very, very particularly experienced in counting how many people there were in the island. Cyprus has some incredibly obscure towns and villages in the hills and mountains and so forth and so on. Probably at a guess... Um, the population would have been maybe at around a hundred thousand, maybe. And if for what well, the population when the British arrived, they counted a census in 1881. It, it probably wasn't the most accurate census, but I, from memory, it's about uh, 25 percent to 74 percent. If that 74 percent Greek Orthodox Christian and 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 25% Muslims. I would say that that would be the probable breakdown back in 1820s. Okay, thank you. Um, question from Con. How does the 1821 revolution impact on the island's national narrative since its independence in 1960 and the 1974 invasion? So that that's, I suppose, the part that I skipped over a bit. Um, but the it, it, it's 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 central really to the nationalist narrative um, because it's a national holiday so is um, so is of course uh, the um, you know the no to Mussolini by Metaxas they're both national holidays um, yet I would argue you know that for instance that occupation the british tra transfer to the british in 1878 or the number of probably about 12,000 men who served in the british armed forces in world war 1 or even you know something like the departure of the corsica which is a previous talk i've given to the community as part of that broader movement uh, immigration movement these are just as pivotal um 
So it, it, it is pivotal because it's commemorated every year. Students attend these marches with um, marching along with the you know the armed forces. There is you know, all those speeches delivered and so forth and so on. It, it has a central feature in the education system. It's given emphasis. Um, and it's very important in creating and instilling this Greek, <coughs> Greek national um, identity amongst Cypriots. Absolutely, very important. Um, and it's even... I mean, it's even, in connection with the question, it's even associated and linked to, you know, 1974 in the sense that some writers will argue that, you know, oh, well, it was the barbaric Turks back in 1821 that did this, and it was the barbaric Turks again who did it in 1974, of course, not stopping to think that, you know, 200 years, uh, bef uh, you know, difference in clearly indicates, I mean, if you're thinking about it in the cool light of the day, it's different people, um, different actors. Um, thank you. Um, it's a question from Michael. Um, why no mention of over a thousand Cypriots who joined the Greek Revolution from its start in 1821, that some were part of the Cypriot Legion headed by uh, Cypriot General Hazipetro, and why also no mention of the mausoleum that exists in Mesolongi, for the Cypriot fallen? Um, well, there, there isn't really any evidence that thousands of Cypriots joined um, because there wasn't any mo real movement from Cyprus to, to, the, to, the, to, the, to the, where they were fighting. Uh, many, there, might, there were Cypriots already there living in wherever, Main, what we would call mainland Greece, um, and had been living there for, for generations. Um, so there, there is evidence that they fought, uh, just like others who were there fought, um, whether we would call them uh, Cypriots who, I mean, they didn't leave Cyprus for the purposes of going there. Um, we're certainly not clear on how many there were. Um, and... Yeah, it, it becomes problematic when you don't have verification through the archives on things like numbers. And so we can't even find the Ionikios' name, right? And and that's really funny how Kumulidis in his book, he, he talks about thousands of Cypriots having served, but the one that everybody in Cyprus will name, uh, Ioannikios, he, he isn't amongst the ones that he mentions. Um, so... Even he tried, you know, to look for the evidence through the through lists and so forth, but it, it was it was impossible to verify these things. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, a participant just comments uh, in one of your remarks you, uh, of about nineteen seventy four. You mentioned uh, the Turkish intervention. Why have you used that term rather than the Turkish invasion? I use the term Turkish military intervention. It's another term that you could use instead of uh, invasion. Okay. okay, I think that's... I've gone through most of the questions, and um, yeah, we might bring an end to proceed now. And I've got thanks for your time. No worries. Um, it's um, just an example where, you know, historians really have to sort of dig deeply, try yes. and find proof um, of um, to be able to substantiate sort of facts and events and um, um, so keep on keep on doing that digging and uh, keep on yeah. coming up with uh, interesting narratives and sort of storylines um, thanks very much and um, hope to see you in, in Melbourne at some stage yeah. Look <laughs> forward to that. some type of um, semi normalcy and um, yeah and um, have a good evening thanks once again thank you likewise cheers and hope to hope to see everyone at that uh, next week's seminars as well